Thank you, Betty Jo. And thank you for coming out. Uh, this is my third trip over the years to Pueblo, my second trip to the Pueblo uh, Library. This presentation uh, is about uh, Malcolm X, and it's done in the Chautauqua format. How many of you, or have any of you ever seen a Chautauqua program? Okay, let me set it up for the rest of you. <clears throat> Chautauqua is a public humanities uh, program that presents the text of a character in two parts. I will present a first person rendition for the first 35 minutes or so uh, as the character Malcolm X. And I would like for you to relate to my verbal text in the same way that you would relate to a written text, that is, critically. Form little question marks in the margins of your mind. Take issue with Malcolm. Don't accept anything uncritically because after 30 minutes or so, I will take questions as Malcolm X. And all my answers must be historically correct uh, based on primary source material. That is, I can't make up anything. And after 20 minutes or so, I will break character and take questions to Charles Pace, the humanities scholar, and I can address questions that Malcolm could not or maybe <laughs> would not answer. <clears throat> The humanities, as we know, are those disciplines that we uh, normally consider to be history, uh, literature, philosophy, uh, jurisprudence or law, uh, religious studies, as well as my primary discipline of anthropology. Principal asked the question, what does it mean to be human? And as an Americanist, I'm asking the question of what it means to be an American. And one of the things we celebrate, of course, is democracy and questioning of authority. So therefore, as I like to say, my text that I will present will be a truth, but it will not be the truth. And I can assure you that it will be something considerably less than nothing but the truth, but my truth about Malcolm. The other little uh, thing to remember is that we're going to do a little suspension of disbelief. <clears throat> Let us assume that this is not the Rocky Mountain area of the United States, but we're in the Northeast, say in Harlem in New York, or maybe uh, Washington, or maybe Philadelphia, uh, or maybe Boston, and that we are all African Americans, and that Malcolm will come out and he will give you uh, his version, and some people talk about uh, the wit and the wisdom of Malcolm. There's an album you can buy. Malcolm had a sense of humor, and I will attempt to uh, present that humor. The time period is 1965, and Malcolm walks out. He gives you his typical uh, Muslim greeting of, Assalamu alaikum. And during the few moments that we have left, we would just like to have an off the cuff chat between you and me, us. We'd like to talk right down to earth in a language that everyone here can easily understand. We all agree. <clears throat> all of the speakers in this program have agreed that America has a very serious problem. And not only does America have a very serious problem, but our people have a very serious problem. America's problem is us. We're her problem. And the only reason that she has a problem is that she doesn't want us here. 
And every time you look at yourself, be you black, <coughs> brown, red, or yellow, a so-called Negro, you represent a person who poses such a serious problem for America simply because you're not wanted. And once we began to face this as a fact, we can begin to chart a course that will make us appear intelligent instead of unintelligent. Now what you and I must learn to do is to forget our differences. When we come together, we don't come together as Baptists or Methodists. You don't catch hell because you're a Baptist. You don't catch hell because you're a Methodist. You don't catch hell because you're a Baptist or a Methodist. You don't catch hell because you're a Mason, a Democrat, Republican, or an Elk. And you sure don't catch hell because you are an American, because if you were an American, you wouldn't catch no hell. You catch hell because you're a black man. You catch hell, all of us catch hell for the same reason. So we all black people, so-called Negroes, second-class citizens, ex-slaves. You're nothing but an ex-slave. You don't like to be told that, but what else are you? You're an ex-slave. You didn't come here on the Mayflower. You were brought here and changed like a horse or a cow or a chicken. And you were brought here by the people who came over on the Mayflower. You were brought here by the pilgrims or so-called founding fathers. They were the ones who brought you here and shot you full of Novocaine. Like when you go to the dentist and he's going to take your tooth, what you do, you start fighting when he starts pulling. So to keep you from fighting back, they squirt some stuff in your jaw they call Novocaine to make you think they aren't doing the thing to you. And because you got all of this Novocaine shot up in you, you sit there and you suffer peacefully. Blood running all down your jaw, but you don't know what's happening, see, because someone has taught you to suffer peacefully. Don't stop suffering. Just suffer peacefully. As Reverend Cleed pointed out, let your blood flow in the streets. This is a shame. <laughs> and he's a Christian preacher. If it's a shame to him, you know what it is to me. Now, there's nothing in our religious book, the Koran, as you call it, Koran, that teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be peaceful, obey the law. Respect every man. But if someone puts his hands on you, send him to the cemetery. And that's a good religion. In fact, that's that old time religion. That's the one that Ma and Pa used to talk about. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a head for a head and a life for a life and nobody. Nobody resents that type of religion being taught except a wolf who intends to make you his next meal. And these old religious Uncle Toms running around here talking about give up your life for freedom. No, brothers and sisters, you preserve your life because it's the best thing you got. And if you must give it up, I say if you must give it up, let it be even Stephen. My earliest recollection as a being snatched awake in the middle of the night because our house was on fire. My mother was a West Indian from Grenada and my father, a militant Baptist minister and follower of Marcus Garvey, preached race pride and separation from the white man. The Lansing arm of the Ku Klux Klan wanted him to stop preaching Garvey's message, but my father was not a frightened Negro, and he kept on. Next thing, he was 
found with his head bashed in, lying across the streetcar tracks. A trolley had almost cut him in half. After my father's death, my mother tried to hold the family together. She couldn't find work because the Christian people of Lansing wouldn't hide a widow of a crazy nigger. But she could stretch bread a dozen ways. Fried bread and stewed bread and when she found raisins bread pudding. When there was no bread, she fed us dandelions, fried grass. We were so hungry, we were dizzy. We stole to stay alive. It was too much for her, so they put her away in a mental institution and parceled out us kids to reform schools, charities, and homes. When you live in a poor neighborhood, you're living in an area where you have poor schools. When you have poor schools, you have poor teachers. When you have poor teachers, you get a poor education. Poor education, you can only work on a poor paying job. And that poor paying job will enable you to live again in a poor neighborhood. So it's a very vicious cycle. I'll never forget the man who taught me English in the eighth grade. He told us that thing about what we wanted to be. I said, I wanted to become a lawyer. He said, you need to think about something you can be, like a carpenter. You got good grades, Malcolm, and people like you. But you've got to be realistic, Malcolm, and a lawyer is not a realistic goal for you because you a nigger. in Roxbury in Boston, Mass. <clears throat> I got my first job at the Roseland Dance Hall Shining Shoes. And on the side, I sold liquor, reefers, and women. I got my first conk laid on. I got me a sharp zoot suit and I used to jitterbug and party all day and I stayed high all night. In fact, I got me a white chick and I ran with the gamblers and the pimps. To stay out of the draft during World War II, I put on a show like I was crazy. I told the army psychiatrist, <laughs> I, uh, I want to join. <laughs> I want to join up. <laughs> I want to join the Japanese army. <clears throat> I can't wait to get my hands on me some guns so I can shoot me up a lot of crackers. I got my 4F. New York was heaven and Harlem was seventh heaven. Five minutes on Lenox Avenue and I'd started on my life of crime. We often hear a lot of talk about the South. And we sometimes wonder why should we up here in the North worry about what happens in the South. Well, first of all, you got to realize that it's not really the South. South, as long as you South of the Canadian border, you South. If one room in your house is dirty, then you got a dirty house. If the kitchen is dirty, you got a dirty house. So don't be saying that this room is dirty, but the rest of my house is clean. You over the whole house. The entire house is under your jurisdiction. And the mistake that you and I make is letting these northern crackers shift the weight to the southern crackers. Now, I don't mean to be standing up here saying things that you didn't think I was going to say. But don't ever, ever call me up here to talk about the South. Because it's controlled right up here in the North. Alabama is controlled from the North. Mississippi is controlled from the North. These northern crackers are in cahoots with the southern crackers. Only these northern crackers will smile in your face and show their teeth and they stick the knife in your back when you turn around. You at least know what that man down there is doing and you know how to deal with it. So all I say is this, this is all I say. 
Whenever you start talking about the one, then talk about the other. Whenever you start worrying about the part or the piece, then worry about the whole. And if that part is no good and that piece is no good, then the whole pie is no good because it all comes from the same plate. It's all made up from the same ingredients. I was into everything the white police and gangsters left over for the black criminal. I was into numbers, bootleg liquor, women, dope. I sold the bodies of white women to black men and black women to white men. I steered white people from downtown to whatever kind of sand they wanted in Harlem. And I'll tell you one thing, my best customers were always the officials. Top police, businessmen, clergymen. Despite the fact that my own father was murdered by whites, I was sick enough to mix and socialize with them. In fact, I considered them to be gods and goddesses. I was caught when I was 21 and sentenced to 10 years in prison. That's when I first heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Mohammed and they turned me around. Because there was something about the statement, the white man is the devil that just clicked. It explained everything. It hit me like a blinding light and I fell on my knees and pledged to Allah that I would tell the black man the true teachings of Islam and the white man the truth about his crimes. We also hear a lot of talk about Africa, East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, South Africa. We sometimes wonder why should we, who have been separated from the African continent for three or four hundred years, worry about what happens in Africa? Well, first of all, you've got to realize that prior to 1954, Africa was controlled by the colonial powers. The colonial powers of Europe, having complete control over Africa, always projected the image of Africa how? Negatively. They always projected Africa as jungles, cannibals, nothing civilized. Uh, then naturally it was so negative that it became negative to you and to me. And we began to hate it without even realizing it. And in hating Africa and hating things African, we ended up hating ourselves. Because you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate Africa and not hate yourself. Now you show me one of these brainwashed Negroes over here who has a negative attitude toward Africa and I'll show you one who has a negative attitude toward himself. You can't have a positive attitude toward yourself and a negative attitude toward Africa at the same time. To the same degree that your understanding of and appreciation toward Africa becomes positive, then you'll also find that your understanding of and appreciation toward yourself will also become positive and this is what the white man knows. So they very skillfully make you and me hate our African features and our African characteristics and you know yourself we have been a people who have hated our African features. Oh yes, we have. We hated our hair, hated our lips, Hated our noses. We wanted one of them long dog-like noses, you know. And in hating Africa and hating the blood of Africa that was within our, within our veins, we began to feel helpless. We began to feel inadequate. We began to feel as though it was holding us back. It wouldn't let us go this way or that way. And when we fell victim to this feeling of helplessness and inadequacy, we turned to someone else to show us the way. We didn't have confidence in black people or a black man to show us the way. In those days, we didn't. We didn't think that a black man could do anything except play some horn. You know, dribble a ball up and down a court. 
But in serious business where our food, our clothing, our shelter, our education were concerned, we turned to the man. Why? Because we felt helpless. What made us feel helpless was our hatred for ourselves, and our hatred for ourselves stemmed from our hatred of things African. Yes, sir. Oh, I've always had the name Malik El Shabazz. Only I've only used it in the Muslim world. Hodge? Well, Hodge is a name that's given to anyone who makes the pilgrimage to Mecca during the official hard season. At Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, I remembered the ancient words of Allah to claim the pilgrimage among men. They will come on foot and upon lean camel, they will come from every deep ravine. From Mecca, the holy city of Islam, I wrote to friends in America. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and true brotherhood as has been shown me here in this ancient holy city the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all of the other prophets from the Holy Scripture. You may be shocked at these words coming from me, but what I have seen has forced me to rearrange many of my previous convictions, to toss aside many of my conclusions previously held. But during the past seven days I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same cup, slept on the same rug, and prayed to the same God as fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. We were truly the same because their belief in one God has erased the whites from their mind, the white from their action, and the white from their attitude. Wearing the Iram garb of a pilgrim, I made the seven circuits around the Kaaba. I drank from the sacred wells of Zimzim and ran back and forth seven times between the hills of Mount Al-Safa and Al-Mana. I stood on Mount Ararat and with my brothers proclaimed, I come, O Lord, in peace. And for the first time in my 39 years, I stood before the creator of all and felt like a complete human being. Sincerely, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X. So, <clears throat> my going into the Muslim world, <clears throat> into the African world, may have solved my problem personally, but I personally feel that my personal problem will never be solved until the plight of black people are solved, so I will remain Malcolm X as long as there's a need to struggle and protest and fight against the injustices that continue to plague black people in this country. Now, we will work with anyone nonviolently, as long as the enemy is nonviolent, but violent when the enemy gets violent. We'll work with you on your rent strikes. We'll work with you on your voter registration drive. And yes, sir, we'll even work with you on your school boycotts. Of course, now, I don't believe in any type of integration. Well, I don't believe in it because you're not going to get it nohow. See, you're not going to get it because you are afraid to die. And you've got to be willing to die if you try and force yourself on the white man because he will get just as violent as those crackers in Mississippi right here in Boston. But we will work with you because we are against a segregated school system. 
A segregated school system produces children who when they graduate, graduate with crippled minds. But it doesn't mean that a school system is segregated because it's all black. <laughs> Look, <clears throat> the white man controls his own school system, his own political system, his own economic system, but he also controls yours. And whenever you're under somebody else's control, then you're segregated. Because they will always give you the worst or the lowest that is to offer. But it doesn't mean that you segregate it because you have your own. Just like the white man has control over his, you got to have control over yours. You know the best way to get rid of segregation? Hmm. The white man is more afraid of separation than he is of integration. Hmm? Now, segregation means he puts you away from him, but not so far away he doesn't have you totally within his power. Separation means that you're gone, and the white man will integrate faster than he will let you separate. So we will work with you because we are against a segregated school system because it's criminal because it's destructive in every way imaginable to the minds of the children who have to be exposed to that type of crippling education. Now, now understand this last point. You have to get back to what the young brother him referred to as a difference between the house Negro and the field Negro. You know, back during the slavery, there were two types of Negroes. You had the house Negro and they lived in the house. And he ate pretty good, because they ate the master's food, what he left. And they lived near the master. And they loved the master more than the master loved himself. Master come with that house Negro. He said, hey, Tom, he said, we got a good house here. Oh, Tom said, yeah, boss, he said, we got a good house here. Every time the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. Master's house catch on fire, that house Negro would fight harder to put out, out than the master would. Master gets sick, that house Negro said, uh, uh, what's the matter, boss, are uh, uh, we sick? We sick. He identified with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you come to that house Negro and you say, let's run away, let's escape, let's separate, he look at you like you were crazy. Uh, uh, what you mean se to separate? Uh, where can I have a better master than I have here? Where can I have a better food than I have here? That was that house Negro. Only back in them days, they called them what they were, house niggers. And that's what we call them today because we still got some house niggers running around here. This modern day house Negro, he loves his master. Hm. He wants to live near him. <laughs> He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near the master and then brag about, uh, I'm the only one out here. <laughs> I'm the only one on this job. You nothing but a house Negro. And if somebody come to you today, you said the same thing that the house Negro said in the plantation. Uh, what you mean, leave America or this good white man? I ain't left nothing in Africa. You left your mind in Africa. But on that same plantation, there were another group of Negroes, field Negroes. See, there was always more Negroes in the fields than there were Negroes in the house. Oh, Negroes in the house ate high up on the hog. Oh, Negroes in the fields ate what was left from the insides of the hogs. They call them chitlin nowadays. Back then, they called them what they were, guts. <laughs> That's what you were, gut eaters. Some of you are still gut eaters. And this field Negro was beaten from sun up to sundown, and he hated the master. I said he hated the master. He was intelligent. Master's house catch on fire. That field Negro didn't help put it out. He prayed for a wind, <laughs> for a breeze. Master got sick. That field Negro hoped that he died. And if you come to that field Negro and you say, let's run away, 
Let's escape. Let's separate. He didn't say where we're going. He said any place is better than here. And you got some field Negroes in America today. The masses are field Negroes. I'm a field Negro. You don't hear these little Negroes talking about our government is in trouble. They said the government is in trouble. Imagine a Negro talking about our government, our army, our Navy. I even heard one say the other day, our astronauts. <laughs> they won't even let him near the plant, but our astronauts. That's a Negro that is out of his mind. That's out of his mind. So in closing, I would just like to say that we all have the same goals, the same objectives. Freedom, justice, equality, and respect as human beings. And in the racial climate of this country, it is anybody's guess which of these extremes and approach might meet a fatal catastrophic end first, non-violent Dr. King, a so-called violent me. Now think about dying. It really doesn't disturb me as it might some people. I've never really felt as though I would live to become an old man. My father and most of his brothers died by violence. My father because of what he believed in. And when you come right down to it, and you take the kinds of things that I believe in, plus the 100% dedication that I have, plus the 100 certainty that I have for whatever I believe in. Well, these are ingredients which make it just about impossible for me to die of old age. I think it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who has lived further down in the mud of human society than I've lived. A black man who's been any more ignorant in his life than I have. A one who's suffered any greater anguish than I have. But it's only after extreme grief that the greatest joy can come. It is only after experiencing darkness that the greatest appreciation of light can come. And it is only after slavery and prison that the greatest appreciation of freedom can come. And for the freedom of my 22 million black brothers and sisters, I do believe that I have fought and struggled the best that I know how and the best that I could with the shortcomings I have. And my shortcomings are many. My greatest lack, I believe, is that I don't have the type of academic education I wish I had been able to get. To have been a lawyer, perhaps, I do believe that I would have made a good lawyer, as I've always loved verbal battle and challenge. And you can believe me that if I had the time, I would not be one bit ashamed to go back into any New York City public school and began in the eighth grade where I left off because I don't began to be academically equipped for so many of the injuries that I have. For instance, I love languages. I don't know anything more frustrating than to be around somebody speaking something you don't understand especially when they are people who look just like you do. When I was in Africa, <clears throat> I heard original mother tongue such as Hausa and Swahili being spoken and there I was standing around like some little boy waiting for someone to tell me what had been said. I'll never forget how ignorant I felt. And aside from the basic African dialects, I think I would study Chinese because it looks as if Chinese would be the most powerful political language of the future. And already I have begun studying Arabic, which I believe will be the most powerful spiritual language of the future. I would just like to study. I mean, ranging study. 
because I have a wide open mind and I'm interested in almost any subject you can mention. In fact, I know this is the reason why I've come to like, as individuals, some of the host of radio and television panel programs I've been on. Uh, Barry Gray, uh, Barry Farber, uh, Mike Wallace in New York, people like them. Because even if they have been in almost constant disagreement with me over the race issue, they've nevertheless managed to keep their minds open about certain truths that are happening in the world today and they let me know they respected my mind in ways I know they never realized it. The way I know it is that <clears throat> oftentimes after an interview program, we would sit around for an hour or so and they would often invite my opinion over various issues. You see, most white men in this country, even if they do credit a black man with some intelligence, still feels that the only issue that he's qualified to speak on is the race issue. You just notice how often you will ever hear a white man asking a black man, what do you think about the problems of world health or the race to put a man on the moon? Anyway, I live each day now as if I'm already dead. I say it like that because from the things that I know, I do not expect to live long enough to read my autobiography in its finished form, but when I am dead, I would just like for you to wait and see if I'm not right in what I say. That the white man in his press will make use of me dead just as he has made use of me while alive as a convenient symbol of hatred. And this will help him to escape facing the truth that all I have been doing is holding up a mirror to reflect, to show the history of unspeakable crimes that his race has committed against my race. And yes, I have cherished my demagogue role. And I know that societies have often killed those who have helped to change those societies. But if I can die having brought any truth, having spread any ray of light that will help to destroy the racist cancer that is malignant in the body of America, then all the credit is due to Allah. Only the mistakes have been mine. And with that, I closed out about two weeks ago the last chapter that I'm dictating to Mr. Alex Haley on my uh, autobiography. <clears throat> but, oh goodness, <laughs> this was not <laughs> supposed to be uh, a monologue. Now, back in that other organization I, I belonged to, we didn't open up for questions, for agreement or disagreement, but times have changed now. So let me just pause and ask if there are any questions that you might like to ask me, Malcolm X, I'd be happy to address them. Uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. When did you become a Muslim? When did I become a Muslim? Well, Actually, it depends upon how you define that term. I joined the Nation of Islam in 1952 when I was in prison. <laughs> it came as a result of a conversation with uh, my brother Reginald. He came to visit me and he said, Malcolm, what would you do if I can introduce you to a man who could get you out of jail? Now, knowing my brother and him knowing me, I thought he was talking about some scam we could run. I said, oh yeah, I'd like to do that, uh, 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 Reginald. Because at that time, I didn't realize that the jail that he was talking about was not some bars here, but the jail was up here. So he said, I'm going to introduce you to a man named Elijah Muhammad, and he's going to free your mind. And I joined the nation there, and when I got out, I went to meet Mr. Muhammad, and he put me the head of one of his temples in Detroit. 
And then I went to Boston, and then I went to New York, and I started to set up temples. We call them temples in that day, mosques all over the country. And then uh, several years ago, he appointed me his national uh, minister. So that was the first time. And then the last time I really became a Muslim was a little over a year ago. And that was when I made my pilgrimage to, uh, uh, and made my Hajj pilgrimage and became an Orthodox Muslim, a Sunni. And so those were the two times that I became a Muslim. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, were you becoming a Muslim for the second time? Was that because you were going to be pushed out from black Muslims and you were more acceptable to becoming a, a Muslim of the other type because you knew you were no longer welcomed in the black Muslim movement? The question is, when I became a Muslim the second time, was that because I was pushed out and I knew that I was not welcome in Mr. Muhammad's organization that I helped build, and so I chose the other way. Uh, exactly, exactly. And I don't know, maybe some parts of it had something to do with me. We, we, we know what happened in this country in 64, November the 22nd. And Mr. Muhammad knew, too. And he said that all of his ministers must make no comment about what happened in Dallas. Now, I don't know, you know, I'm so used to speaking and giving my mind. So when the newsman asked me, what do you think? I said, well, you know, it's just a case to me of the chickens coming home to roost. And I didn't mean anything disrespectful for that. I just simply meant that the violence that, that this country was founded in, that's been going on for 200 years, has finally come to strike down its chief executive. But Mr. Muhammad called me in, and I, there was this cold feeling between us. You know, we, we'd been so close till I could walk into a room and I could just sense the energy between us. And finally he said, Malcolm, he said, you know, that was a grievous mistake you made. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I know. And uh, then he said something as though way away, he said, you know, I must silence you. I said, yes, sir. I said, I, I, I submit 100%. And then I left, and I was in that old bureau of mine driving up Riverside Drive, going back up to Harlem. And the word came over the news. I, I saw it that said, Malcolm X, Minister of the Nation of Islam, has been suspended and that he would be reinstated if he submits. I went, if he submits, of course I submit. Everyone knows, yes sir, I submit. And then I began to wonder what was going on. And gradually things began to work and oh, there perhaps was some jealousy from some of the brothers who felt as though as a national minister, I was getting too high and mighty saying that Brother Malcolm was more concerned about Brother Malcolm than he was the organization, which was not true. I always gave the Honorable Elijah Muhammad credit and then the real break came when some of the rumors that I, in fact, Dick Gregory, I know, do you know Dick Gregory? In fact, anyway, Dick, friend of mine, uh, Dick used to say to me, he said, Malcolm, you're very intelligent. How can you follow that man? I would bridle at that. I love Dick, but I didn't want him saying that. And gradually, rumors started to develop, and I began to look into them, and I began to investigate them. And the upshot of it is there were certain young women that worked in the national headquarters. And then after a while, they would just certainly disappear and be gone for eight or nine months. They would come back, they would have a child, they're unmarried women. And I came to understand it that they were being fathered by the man that I was willing to give up my life for, and I felt like a fool. So I came to the brothers and I said, now we, we can work this out. We, we can talk about the sign of prophecy. I was trying to give him an out. And then they began to say, if you knew what Malcolm was saying about the messenger, you'd kill him yourself. And at that point, I realized that I've always been as much as I can about truth. And when I discover a new truth, I had to be forthcoming about that. And so I opened up to the nation what I had discovered, and well, that was it. Now, nobody will kill you quicker than a Muslim. I know, I have trained some of them. But then other things began to happen that let me know that, well, it might not just be Mr. Muhammad. Because after I made that second trip from England, I was on my way back to, to the city and the plane stopped at Orly Airport in Paris. 
man came on, identified himself as a mem member of the uh, French Interior Ministry, walked up to my plane and said, are you Mr. Malcolm X? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're not wanted on French soil. At that point, I realized, now, Mr. Muhammad got power, but he doesn't have that much power. So then I began to understand that there were forces much greater than some ignorant brother out here, or even stronger than, than, than the messenger who had me in their sights. But basically, that was it. And I went through a crisis, and I got to thank Muhammad Ali after that fight. He took me in, and you know, I had brought him into the organization. And uh, after I was forced out, I wanted to make the pilgrimage, had always wanted to make it. And then when I made it, I saw uh, all colors. And I was in Algeria talking to Bumadin, as a matter of fact, talking to some Algerian brothers who in this country, if they had been in this country, they would be considered white. But their revolutionary potential was, 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 was without question. And so I began to understand that the consciousness of a person in terms of a broader humanity had nothing to do with pigmentation of the skin. And when I saw Muslims from all over the world worship together, at that point I realized I had found the true religion and that was the true Islam. That was a long story, but yes, that was why. And it was those series of events that led to my ouster. Other questions? Muhammad Ali, when, uh, when you left black Muslim and Muhammad Ali and all of them uh, had to break ties with you because you were no longer black part of the Muslim movement, the black Muslim movement, and they left, did that bother you at all? Question is, when I was ousted from the movement and Muhammad Ali and other friends uh, that I had brought in had to break ties with me because I was persona non grata, was I hurt? I was hurt because I, I, I felt a, a personal attachment to these brothers. I love these brothers. I, oh, that, he's a big kid. I loved him to death. But I understood. I wanted him to follow the true way, but I understood that was his decision. He had no choice. He had to do what he had to do. And that was, that was what he had to do. But was I hurt? Yes. Yes, I was. Yes, ma'am. When, when did you die and how? Well, I'm still here thus far, and I'm, 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 I'm looking uh, <clears throat> over my shoulders. You know, uh, you know about that bomb that exploded in my home two weeks ago. They thought they could get me. My wife, my children were there. But fortunately, we got out, and uh, so I'm, I'm still here. Yes, ma'am. What do I think about the whole situation right now? Turmoil. Turmoil and chaos. The whole country is in turmoil or chaos. Not only in this country, we know what's happening in Southeast Asia, or that Vietnam. I have to agree with Muhammad Ali about that. You know, why should he go and fight and kill folks who got nothing to do with him? And are we going to escalate this war? It seems as it is. And with, with the recent election, it was a case of what? Uh, Goldwater the wolf or Johnson the fox? Well, the fox won, and it seemed as though the fox is going to continue to escalate that war. And so uh, that's the state that we're in now, but we must continue to persevere. It's been worse for us, of course, but it's turmoil and it's chaos. Yes, sir. I see, Malcolm, I'm not black, but. I would just like to say, listening to you and what you had to say, I felt that I was not worthy of just a being because of your words and the inspiration you brought with those words. I feel now that I am free to, to fight the oppression and to fight the, the, the chains of economic poverty. And I would just like to thank you for your words and your inspiration. And, Make me feel soft words. Well, I appreciate that, sir. And uh, 
we have two organizations, Muslim Mosque Incorporate, that we invite all folk who would like to be a part. As I said, Islam does not distinguish on people. Anyone with a heart can join it. We have our political organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity model. When I was in Addis Ababa and over in Ethiopia, I sat in as an as a, as a honorary president with the heads of states of the Organization of African Unity, and I came back here. We've set that organization up to become an umbrella organization for all uh, black organizations. But it doesn't matter about quarter, uh, uh, color, it's about human beings. I mean, I was walking down Fifth Avenue the other day, and a white man uh, walked up to me and asked me, uh, Minister Malcolm, would you shake hands with a white man? I said, sir, uh, I'll shake hands with a human being. And we shook hands. So that's what it's about now. It's about human beings coming together as human beings to build a better world. But I appreciate your comments. I appreciate your feelings. One last question for Malcolm. Mm-hmm. I guess, too, that I will be killed and not see my girls grow up. I guess that's the biggest fear. Uh, maybe it <clears throat> not has been as helpful to my wife, Betty, as I could be. She keeps a, <clears throat> a suitcase packed and she's raised the family well, and that I won't be around to give her more help than that. And I suppose that I can't undo some of the wrong, although I did it in good faith with the other brothers that I have brought into the organization, that I can't help to bring them into the light as I have seen it. I guess those are my feelings of inadequacy at this point in terms of, of my personal life. And the biggest fear for this country as a whole, I mean, America has so much potential and it can be whatever we want it to be and that we can get enough individuals of all colors, of all races to come together to be what the founding fathers that I used to ridicule used to talk about. I didn't ridicule the idea that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that idea, to make that idea a reality for all of those who are gonna come after us, that I won't be around to do my part. And that, that's why I wrote that book, that perhaps my life can serve as, a, as, as maybe an example, not so much of what to do, but of what not to do in terms of your life. And so I'm leaving that, and I've trusted that to Mr. Mr. Haley, and he's done a wonderful job uh, on doing with it. But this was not supposed to be uh, a monologue. Uh, I, it, so I'm glad we opened it up, and I know you have things to do. I have one other uh, presentation, so let me uh, pause and bring out uh, scholar Charles Pace to deal with the questions that Malcolm X could not answer or maybe would not answer. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> question for Charles Pace. Yes, sir. When I studied, uh, I read a lot about Malcolm X, I wanted to, I don't know why I did, I just started reading about Cesar Chavez and a little bit about, about Martin Luther King and I wanted to learn a little bit about, you know, I wanted to, I started studying Malcolm X, I read Malcolm X by any means necessary, Malcolm X speaks, just, I just read his biography, I read a lot of things of him and I learned a lot of him and I talked to people about him, black people, you know, I try to inspire them to know him and to get to them to study him and they tell me, how come you don't learn about your kind? You know, why is it you, you, you learn about the black folk? Or why is it you want to know about Malcolm X? And I tell them, you know, I'm not white, but they teach me of George Washington, they teach me of Abraham Lincoln, they teach me of these people. They said, what's wrong with me admire someone of a black color? They said, they want me admire, to admire all these people that are white, but I can't admire someone of another color, a black. I said, you know, you ought to learn of him. He's very inspirational and he can teach you something. 
And it's not about white and black, it's about education. I think that's what you guys need. You need some education, but is it wrong for me to, to want to inspire people to learn some other, of the other ethnicity? Oh, absolutely not. That's the whole purpose of learning and living. In my other life, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and anthropology, anthropos, means human, and ology is the study of. So anthropology is the study of humankind in all our diversity. And to learn about one part of the human community is to learn about all part and oneself. So I think we should all want to learn about the other because the other is us, because it takes all of us for the part. So absolutely not, absolutely not. So I would hope that they would expand their mind to want to know about that as well. Yes, ma'am. Speak louder. No problem. <laughs> uh, we have uh, some friends in Indiana. They are Persian. And their son, he's old now and he's a lawyer or something, he was really interested in Malcolm X's life. And he was reading about that. And, he would be, and these two parents were so upset. And they said that, why do you do this? Why don't you read about the rest of them? So he came and he talked to me about that. Mm -hmm. And I encouraged him and I said, anytime you want to discuss things, come here, don't tell your parents. They, they really were afraid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He may get to a wrong crowd or something bad happened to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, and, and that is a problem. And of course, uh, the, the real answer to that, uh, the only solution to ignorance is more knowledge. And so uh, knowledge, as they say, will set you free. And so the more that you can learn about someone, as Malcolm would say, you can at least know what not to do in terms of a bad example to develop what to do. That was a question here and then Medora. Who else do you portray beside Malcolm X? Who else do I portray beside Malcolm X? I do what I call about 250 years of African-American thought, leadership. And I look at what I call of black men, of course, and looking at how they were able to transcend the obstacles and leverage the opportunities that stood between them and democracy. So moving through history, the first one historically would be York, who traveled with the Lewis and Clark expedition to the Pacific, 1803 to 1806. Frederick Douglass, the great Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, 1818-1895. Booker T. Washington, the man who became the quote-unquote leader of the Negro people as an educator, beginning in 1895 when he gave that famous Atlanta Compromise speech. Douglass died in 95. Washington gave his speech in 95. Then Washington's uh, friend and sometime intellectual nemesis, the great W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the founding uh, members of the NAACP. Then there is Malcolm. Then there is the great Langston Hughes, the uh, people's poet, the man we consider the first professional black writer to make his living exclusively from writing. Not the first to make his money, but to make, to say, I want to be a writer, an exclusively writer. And about four years ago, I uh, uh, created my seventh character, and that was uh, Gordon Parks, the photographer and cinematographer. And I'm now, uh, we start researching my eighth character this year, 2014 uh, was the beginning of World War I uh, in Europe. The U.S. entered the war in uh, 1917. But I'm, I will be researching uh, James Reese Europe, first lieutenant uh, with the 369th Harlem Hell Fighters, they called themselves. He was the first black man to lead a combat unit uh, in World War I, stationed with the French in his other life over here, Europe was a great composer uh, and a musician, and he was the transitional figure between ragtime music and jazz music. So those are the, what I call my bodacious brothers. <laughs> um, how did he die? How did Malcolm X die? How did Malcolm X die? Malcolm was assassinated February 24, uh, 1st, 1965, 
at the Audubon Ballroom. He was about to address an audience. His wife and his daughters were there, and he was assassinated by a group of men. So we know those men who did it, but still we don't know. Uh, <clears throat> one man, the last one I think has been released from prison about two or three years ago. One man who was in prison said, I had nothing to do with it. He said, I'm being framed. One of the men who was in prison said, yes, I was there and I did help assassinate it. Malcolm. But this man over here who says he was innocent, truly was innocent, he had nothing to do with it. So, uh, but that was how he died that night. Were they acting on their own or was it part of some other organization? That's the question. What was behind the assassination? I say it was forces and it was many forces. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, uh, Claiborne Carson, a professor now at Stanford, who's editing the Martin Luther King papers. One of his first book was called Malcolm X and the FBI Files. And he's, years ago he got that, and there's this memo from J. Edgar Hoover, who as we know, during his lifetime was the most powerful man in, the, in this country, reality-wise, because he was head of internal security, says that Malcolm could be the leader of a black revolutionary group that not Dr. King because the masses of blacks in the urban area would follow Malcolm and Malcolm was absolutely unviable. They couldn't turn him. So we know individuals but there were all kinds of forces that were there to incite. One of the things about Hoover, he didn't, couldn't deal with too far right or too far left. Hoover got the Ku Klux Klan. Well, one of the ways that you get the Ku Klux Klan is dissemination. He would set up situations where he would have Klan members turn on other Klan members. And so uh, there's enough evidence to believe that that happened with Malcolm. So there were a number of people from the government to members of the Nation of Islam to individual members of the Nation of Islam who was perhaps jealous of Malcolm's power all there, but once you start spreading rumors, and then the puppeteer is up here who knows where it all goes, he can just lay it out and then allow the people to kill themselves. So all of those reasons, I would say, come together to make Malcolm die. Well, let me give you my reading, two pages, actually a page and a half. 2.3 minutes <laughs> as to how I see Malcolm. <clears throat> I call this Malcolm X, Pilgrim and the Search of a Common Humanity. When the man known as Malcolm X was assassinated on 21 February 1965, a physically young yet spiritually complete life was brought to an all too early abrupt end. In his brief 39 eventful years, Malcolm had achieved a degree of wholeness in his life that few humans of any age are fortunate enough to experience. He was a man who had confronted and transcended three major rites of passage, a rite which led from his ego, through his ethnic, and into a global sense of his wider human potential. He had obtained a pan-human state of political spiritual growth. Malcolm X stated during his last days that he had come to champion that which is good for humanity as a whole. The three rights. As a young street hustler, Malcolm Little had been concerned primarily about the satisfaction of his personal carnal pleasures, his ego needs and desires. After his prison sentencing of 10 years for petty criminal activity, he was forced to reflect upon the quality of his life. He joined the Nation of Islam under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad. And upon his release from prison as a reward for his superb Organizing and speaking abilities, Mr. Muhammad appointed Malcolm to the post of national minister. And from this involvement, Malcolm developed a deeper sense of his ethnic responsibility to teach and awaken the so-called brainwashed black masses. 
Malcolm X helped black America to see and analyze their plight in historical and international perspective. Finally, in the wake of his ouster from the nation, acceptance of Orthodox Islam, he was a Sunni, and conversion experience in Mecca, Malcolm was forced into an encounter with his wider global self. He toured several African and Middle Eastern countries, often as the personal guest of prime ministers and presidents. This series of mind-expanding encounters convinced Malcolm that American white racism was not genetically determined as he had formerly believed, but rather socially constructed. The significance of this discovery was that he came to see that radical socio-political, i.e. structural change within American society could cure it of its 300-year-old racist tradition. His writing and speeches provided a record of the growth and development of a constantly evolving mind. The autobiography of Malcolm X is now an American culture classic. It documents a life of struggle, change, and triumph. Thus, it is not a tragedy, but rather a living testament of hope. Now, after almost a half century following his death, his words serve as a stimulus for new thought. It is a rich legacy for the rest of us to explore through history, film, anthropology, literature, visual arts, poetry, music, dance, theater, courses and seminars in a variety of settings, American studies, public humanities at its best. This is what it is for me at any rate. Over the past 30 plus years, I have spoken his words and analyzed his life with audiences from Texas to Tanzania, from South Dakota to South Africa, and from Old England to New England. There is an African saying which asserts, to speak a dead man's name and words is to make him live again. I speak, thus X lives. Enough said. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>